Hello, everybody. I'm Neil Foote, principal lecturer at the Mayborn School of Journalism and director of the Mayborn Literary Nonfiction Conference. Uh, and today I have the great opportunity to chat with Marty Barron, uh, the recently uh, retired uh, editor of the Washington Post, uh, executive editor of the Washington Post, uh, who joins us uh, for the second time in the last five years. Marty joined us back in 2016 the summer of 2016, prior to some election that took place in that November and kind of changed the world for the last five years or so. Uh, but Marty, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. Excellent. Uh, I, I, you know, chatting a little bit before we started the record, I asked you, well, how is life after February 28th? Uh, how are you feeling? What's the what's, what's day in the life look like nowadays? Well, I feel pretty good. Uh, you know, um, it's actually been quite busy. I've been, um, uh, there's a lot of paperwork attached to disconnecting from work. I've discovered there's a lot of work and trying not to work. So, um, uh, and, you know, I've been doing a lot of interviews like this and uh, I've been talking to people about other opportunities, uh, see what those are. And I haven't made any decisions and uh, preparing to move out of DC and find a small apartment in New York and uh, doing a lot of different things and meeting with friends and, and uh, that sort of thing. So it's been nice, but I've been busy actually. Yeah, there you go. It sounds that way. Uh, what, what do you miss the most about being in the newsroom? Uh, well, it's what I miss uh, while we've been in this pandemic actually, and that is mm -hmm. being around people, uh, that are good people and, People who are not just great journalists, but also just uh, good to be around. And, uh, you know, I think that's what we should all value. And I think what we've grown to, perhaps we had taken for granted, but have grown to appreciate over the course of the past year is just how much we value being around uh, other human beings and uh, good people. That's, uh, that is so true. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of amazing the past year has kind of zipped by with us being in this, this bubble uh, for ourselves uh, right. uh, at a time when the news cycle has probably been the most intense that it's ever been. Uh, I, 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 there's so many questions. I, I want to begin with you know, your, your journey at the Washington Post, and then we can kind of talk a little bit about some of the other work you've done in your, your wonderful career. Uh, chat a little bit about uh, the Spotlight uh, movie and the experience of, of, of the investigation there, uh, and close with you know, some advice and, and insights to uh, not only uh, our students uh, here at the Mayborn School, but also professionals in this business who I think are looking, looking for uh, some, some keys to succeeding. So let me, let me go right into it. Uh, certainly uh, you, you arrived at the Washington Post at an interesting time uh, uh, in, the, in the newspaper's history. I spent some four or five years there early in my career uh, at again, a transitionary time for the newspaper. Talk about what changes, uh, you know, that period when you came into the newspaper and then the changes that you had to make as you adapted to uh, the, the election of a, of a president who didn't like the press too much. Right. Well, I came in at a very different time. I think that, uh, you know, the paper was uh, uh, hurting financially. It was uh, laying people off. Uh, there was the prospect of more of that. There had been a very sort of fitful merger of the digital operations with the print operations, uh, which is always difficult, um, always has been difficult. And so, um, uh, and there was not much prospect of that changing. Uh, the, the strategy of the Post had been to focus very heavily on our region. It was described as foreign about Washington, which meant of course that we would cover uh, the government and cover politics. But other than that, we would be focusing very much on the uh, district on Virginia and on Maryland. Um, and that was the strategy of the post and then to shrink to that size, uh, whatever that appropriate size was. And we weren't sure what that was. Um, and, um, you know, there was a lot of work to be done even in that environment. Uh, and uh, I think that we needed to um, elevate our enterprise, have more of it, um, have it be more ambitious, do more investigative reporting. Uh, and that's what I was pushing for at the time. And and actually only a few months into my time here at the Post was confronted with a very big investigative story 
uh, when Bart Gelman came to us with the documents that had been leaked to him by Edward Snowden, whose name he did not know at the time that he came to us. Uh, and uh, we had to make a decision about whether to publish those documents uh, as well. So, um, uh, so that was the uh, that was the environment in which we were operating. And then, of course, in the summer of uh, 2013, uh, it was announced that uh, Jeff Bezos would acquire the Post. That was only six months after I had arrived, uh, and that deal was closed very quickly. Three months later, uh, and that really changed uh, everything. Jeff had. Uh, told us right from the very beginning that uh, our strategy needed to change, uh, that the strategy that we had might have been a good one for a different era. But uh, now uh, we were in a position uh, to uh, go national and international uh, because uh, we had taken all the pain of the internet. Uh, it had destroyed every pillar of our financial foundation. And, um, and yet we had not taken what the internet had to offer as a gift, as he put it. Uh, and the gift was worldwide distribution at virtually no additional cost. And, um, and here we were in the nation's capital uh, with the capacity to do that. And he said we had a number of advantages. One, we were uh, in the nation's capital, which was, a, of course, a good base for becoming national. Number two, we had the name, the Washington Post, which was a good name for leveraging to a national and even international level. And number three, we had a, 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 um, an identity that was formed really at the time of Watergate, of shining a light in dark corners. And it was even though we were sort of regional in our business ambitions at the time, uh, we had uh, we were recognized around the country for that 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 period of the Washington Post and for that kind of work, and were known as an investigative or uh, organization, and so uh, that gave us an identity that we could uh, build upon, and so and with the internet we had the capacity to go nationwide and worldwide, and uh, because we didn't have to deliver physical papers anymore. And so with that, we, we shifted our strategy to becoming national and international. That's, that's interesting because certainly during the, the, my time there, it was you know, the Washington Post, certainly uh, with, with uh, the Watergate history behind it was, and its wonderful kind of political legacy was described as that regional paper. There, there's a lot of discussion about the vision of the paper and, it, and it's, and uh, Talk about you know, how you kind of shifted the culture of the newspaper from one that had a certain you know, focus, as you said, of kind of regional, political, governmental affairs to this, this, this major national uh, newspaper, international newspaper. How do you shift the culture? What, do, what, are the, what, are, what were some of the things that you had to do to get people to believe that that was the direction to go in? Uh, we had to do good stories. Uh, they had to have an impact. Uh, they had to become a model for what we should do in the future. Certainly the Snowden documents were as helpful in that, in that regard. We were doing the most ambitious work um, and uh, not being, uh, and going at it hard and do, it was controversial and there were high risks attached to it. And we didn't let that dissuade us. Uh, and we had a huge impact on the Post and also the Guardian, which received those documents was doing uh, a, lot of, a lot of work. So um, I apologize for the background noise. There's painting going on in my place. So you'll have to, you'll have to tolerate that. Um, so uh, as I said, I'm sort of preparing the place for sale. So um, uh, in any event, um, this is, um, there's gonna be a fair amount of this, um, <laughs> apologize. Um, so, um, you know that's what we had to do is we had to sort of focus on focus on that and um, and just do do ambitious work uh, and not and and let that be a model for what we needed to do. I'm a big believer in uh, not obsessing about the culture as much as sort of creating the culture uh, with through the work itself. I love that that quite that, that notion of creating the culture and certainly the the Snowden story. Uh, was it was massive and had all sorts of implications about access to documents, freedom of the press, uh, how much you share of that information with so many sensitive documents. How did you approach telling that story uh, without violating international trade? Yeah, you know, you know, certainly a lot of security and classified information. What was your strategy with trying to get that story? And I know Bart Gelman kind of took a, a, yeah. a, a very interesting strategy on making sure that, that you all approach that in a very sensitive way. 
Well, look, there are critics who would say that we did violate uh, the law in doing that. Uh, that's not really clear, uh, but there are risks attached to that with the Espionage Act of 1917. Uh, that said, we felt that uh, we had to evaluate whether there was a public interest in, in revealing those documents. Uh, and that's true in a, a lot of national security reporting where classified information is revealed. And that's been, it's, has, that's not unusual that classified information is, is revealed in certain kinds of national security reporting. Uh, but this was particularly sensitive stuff. And, um, you know, what we had, what we talked about is that there was a major public interest here, that the, the government had been engaged in surveillance that um, that uh, had never been the subject of public debate, that there, that there was an intrusion into the privacy of American citizens that was beyond anything that anybody uh, could have expected. And so, um, and yet it had been done without any discussion as to whether this is proper public policy. And, um, and so uh, we felt there was a very important uh, public policy issue here. And ultimately, you know, others came to view that as, to believe that as well. I mean, the technology companies questioned their own participation in this uh, and argued that it had gone beyond what was really appropriate. Uh, the president at the time, President Obama, uh, said that we were having a debate that uh, should have occurred uh, and it needed to occur. Uh, that wasn't their posture at the beginning. Uh, but that became their posture over time with the revelations. Uh, and there were mem many members of Congress who felt that, uh, you know, the national security agencies had gone too far. The intelligence agencies had simply gone too far. And, uh, and there had been, and there was reform. And that was, that sentiment was true among both Democrats and Republicans. It was bipartisan. And, um, and at the same time, there were others who felt that, uh, frankly, there were some people who said we should have been prosecuted. But, um, so it was controversial, uh, but we had to make a decision about whether that was uh, appropriate for us to do. Uh, and we concluded that there was an enormous public um, public policy issue here at stake. Uh, and the only way to get at it was to actually publish these documents and to do it carefully, uh, to do it in, in we certainly uh, talked to the intelligence agencies. They knew in advance what we were going to publish. We gave them an opportunity to A, comment, and B, argue that particular details uh, are best, were best uh, kept secret. And so uh, that's what we did. Uh, in some instances, there were some details that we withheld, but uh, we never killed a story. Um, so that was the thinking that was behind that. Well, Marty, we, we know you, you've never been one to shy away from a, a big story. Uh, it, it's certainly before the, the post you, you were at the Washington, at, you were at the Boston Globe and the whole spotlight team and the abuse of, of the Catholic Church. Yeah, I mean, talk a little bit about, yeah, certainly what you did at the Boston Globe in, 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 in unveiling and approaching uh, those kind of big controversial stories. Is there a method or a strategy that you take upon, you know, these, these stories that clearly get to the the bone of some controversial issues. Uh, uh, how did you manage, uh, th did the spotlight work inform you better about how to approach the Snowden series? Uh, what were some of those key things that you did that kind of helped uh, prepare yourself for a newsroom like the Boston Globe then uh, to, to get journalists to realize to go one step further on such controversial issues? Sure. I mean, I think there are basically a couple of principles. I mean, one is that uh, a core to our mission is holding power to account. That's number one. Um, number two is that um, uh, when the facts are not known, when the truth is uh, elusive, our job is to try to go to find, go find it, find out what the facts are, put them put them in proper context, and then and then report them. Um, uh, you know, um, I think that those are those are the two core principles. I think that when you're, when we're reading our own coverage day to day, often questions arise as to what is the backstory here, uh, what is really going on, um, and and you know sometimes those are just left unanswered, and I think it's really important that we always try to answer those 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 questions. You know, who is making policy here? Who is be, who is going to be affected by this policy? Uh, what are the interests at stake? Um, all of all of that. Who is pushing for this policy, um, and uh, and really try to try to get at what are the internal deliberations that took place that led to such a policy, um, and you know that is something that we should do regardless of who we're reporting on. 
doesn't matter whether it's a Democrat or a Republican or another an institution that is not political in nature, that uh, but has an it has a serious impact, has a significant impact on society at large. It can be a commercial enterprise, it can be a nonprofit enterprise, um, but it's one that has tremendous influence. And so, in the case of the church. Uh, this was uh, the most powerful institution in New England at the time, it's not today, but it was then. And, um, um, and here was an instance when I, when I got to Boston, there had been a column written the day before I started working uh, by Eileen McNamara, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist about this case of a priest by the name of John Gagan, who had been accused of abusing as many as 80 kids. And uh, the lawyer for the plaintiffs in that case had argued that the Cardinal himself was aware of the abuse and yet continually reassigned uh, that priest from parish to parish, knowing full well about the abuse of which he had been accused, uh, thus enabling him to abuse again and again. And so, um, and at the end of the column, she said, well, the truth may never be known because the internal documents um, that might reveal it uh, are under court seal, uh, meaning they were kept confidential. And of course the church had denied these uh, denied these allegations and said that they were baseless and reckless. Um, and so the natural question that I had is, well, who's telling the truth here? I mean, there are serious allegations here uh, that a cardinal was aware of an abusive, a ser seriously abusive priest and allowed him to continue abusing uh, such that there were at least uh, 80 uh, kids who had, been, uh, who had been abused. I mean, how can you not want to look more deeply at that? And so, and we didn't need to be deterred by the fact that the uh, documents were under seal. And in fact, uh, the fact that there were documents was enticing uh, because could we actually get those documents? And so that was the question. And could an argument be made that we were entitled to them? And, and that is the argument that we made is that we were entitled to them. That there was a public interest um, and that uh, these kids were in the care of the church and, uh, and that we should get them. And so um, that's what we went about doing, in addition to doing our own, uh, the Spotlight team doing their own investigation. Yeah, I think what was fascinating certainly about that story is that you could have easily done this, uh, you know, devastating story about the, the, the Catholic Church in Boston, but you, want, you went several steps further. What, what, was the motivation of going beyond just the the, the, the Boston and Massachusetts area? How did, how did you define, we need to go further with this? This is a bigger story than just what's happening in, in Boston. Right, well, the first step we took in terms of making bigger was going beyond just saying there were a lot of abusive priests because uh, the Spotlight team was able to document, uh, you know, fairly quickly that there were a lot of abusive priests. Uh, and, um, but we didn't just want to do a story on that. And we wanted to document, you know, address the question of, well, what did the church do when it learned that these priests were abusive? Did in essentially each and every case, did they do the same thing they did with this priest, John Gagan? Did they in fact cover it up, reassign the priest, allow the priest to abuse again and again? And so we were pursuing that bigger story, not just the fact that there were a lot of abusive priests. And that's what we, that was the, that's what made that story so explosive is that we were able to document that cover up uh, with the church's own um, internal documents. And so, um, and after that, then it was clear that, um, I mean, I, I, mean I, I think there's another point that should be made with regard to investigations and that is almost nothing is a one-off. Uh, there's almost, it's always a pattern. I mean, you don't, people don't do things in only one case typically. So uh, if, John G if this had happened in the case of John Gagan, the question was, did it happen in other cases? And if it happened in the case of the Archdiocese of Boston, well, did it happen in other dioceses? Uh, and the answer to all of those questions was yes. And if it happened in the United States, did it happen around the world? And the answer to that, of course, is yes. So um, we did our best as a, regional, as a regional publication to try to get at all of those. And also, you know, we started to face some competition from uh, major national news outlets uh, that were saying, okay, well, the Boston Globe had done Boston, but, you know, the New York Times, they had said, we're going to go do the country and we'll beat them on the country. And so we pivoted so that we would start covering what was happening around the country as well, um, uh, because 
at that point, we were going to face some serious competition from other media outlets. Thanks for that, Marty. Now, this major story goes off to become a an Oscar-winning movie. Uh, what would you please share uh, with folks who may have seen the movie and others who, who now may be curious to see it? How accurate is that movie? What was your experience in working with the the, the folks who wrote the screenplay and certainly the lead actor, Lee Schreiber? Uh, how, you know, we, we've seen plenty of journalism movies uh, about journalism. Tell us how that mat matched kind of the experience of what you led in your newsroom and what your reporters experienced. Sure. I think, I mean, it was, I mean, obviously there's creative license. It's a movie, it's not a documentary. So I think we need to understand the difference between the two. Um, there was a documentary done. Uh, uh, but um, I think that it's very faithful to the overall um, uh, evolution of that investigation uh, and uh, that it captures the broad themes uh, and the key moment and key moments. Um, and so I think it's faithful to the truth in that sense. Uh, and, and, and it's actually faithful on a lot of different things, including, for example, that first meeting where uh, I wanted to pursue that investigation uh, at, on my first day at work. So, uh, so um, and the, and the, look, the the writers um, uh, Tom McCarthy and Josh Singer did an incredible amount of research. I mean, Josh is you know has an MBA and a and a and a law degree from Harvard, so he dug into all of the legal documents. I mean, all of them. Uh, and certainly understood all of them, and uh, and he looked through a copious amounts of emails, uh, particular from particularly from Walter Robinson, who seemed to save everything. And so, and then they constructed dialogue essentially out of, in some instances, straight, essentially straight out of the, uh, out of the emails. In fact, the, the, the dialogue with respect to my desire to pursue the bigger story of the cover up and not just the number of priests who had abused was drawn from an email that I had sent, uh, I had sent Robbie. So, I mean, I did that more as email than I did as a, you know, a group meeting the way it was portrayed in the movie, but uh, the essence is is the same. So, I mean, I felt uh, I felt very good about the movie. I felt that it was a um, it was faithful to the broad outline of that investigation, and uh, and I was very glad that the writers had had been had spent so much time doing their research. And they talked to us endlessly. Um, I mean, they talked to. I mean, the I, I got to the point where I told them I had nothing more to tell them. I just. I said, You've, I'm tapped out here. Uh, so they just, they, they asked about everything. That's great. Were, were you surprised that it got best picture that year? Or was that uh, just well, I was surprised moment? the movie was even made, frankly. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have any of the qualities you see in movies these days, which is, uh, you know, action scenes and action figures and special effects and all of that. I mean, the only action in that movie is looking through paperwork. Uh, so, uh, I mean, it's not exactly excitement. Uh, so, and it, it, you look, I mean, it's, it has no romance. It has just the opposite. It has, uh, um, it was a good chance that many uh, in the public would be offended by it because it was about a sensitive issue affecting uh, you know, people of a Catholic faith. And, and so it was every good reason for people to avoid it, avoid the movie. And, and they did have a hard time getting financing, actually, and it fell through m multiple times. So, um, yeah, I was surprised uh, that it won. Um, I was hopeful uh, that it would. Um, and even during the, you know, the Oscar ceremony, which I was happy to attend, um, although I was in practically the last i was in the second to the last row of the highest level so um you know i mean it had won only one award prior to winning the the oscar for best picture so that's not the normal pattern so um so yeah uh i was surprised and i think a lot of people were surprised but it was it was fantastic so and there was uh as from what i understand there was cheering in a lot of newsrooms at that moment i'm, I'm sure there were i'm sure there was I want to fast forward and pick up on this 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 theme that you talked about about holding power into account, and, and fast forward to 2016 and 
uh, the time we last chatted with you, we were in the midst of a presidential campaign with uh, then uh, Donald uh, Trump and uh, Hillary Clinton uh, and the election of Trump uh, that led to a really this uh, 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 certainly a transformative time in the country's history, but also a direct attack on journalists themselves and, and was specifically the Washington Post uh, being banned from the White House and coverage. Uh, talk about what the, the, the experience of, of trying to manage a newsroom covering uh, certainly uh, a president in this case, but what did you do to try to uh, respond to uh, the president's allegations and his banning? Uh, what were the, the, the key themes that you had to reinforce with your reporters and editors during this coverage? Well, I guess it was encapsulated in what I said, um, and I guess my most famous line, uh, which was, we're not, we're not at war, we're, we're at work. Um, and I, I mean, I said, we're not at war with the administration, we're at work. You know, the Trump, uh, on his very first full day uh, in office, he went to the CIA and uh, for some reason, of course, started, started to talk about the media, which of course was not relevant to being at the CIA, but he talked about how he was at war, that, as many of you know, he said, I'm at war with the media. Um, and, uh, you know, my reaction was, well, I'm not, not at war with him. Um, we're just doing our jobs, you know? I mean, that's our jobs is assigned, essentially assigned to us under the Constitution of the United States, you know? The reason the First Amendment was written in the first place, and James Madison was the primary author, was that, you know, he talked about freely examining public characters and measures, and uh, public characters particularly meaning government officials and measures meaning their policies. And that's, that's what we do. That's, I mean, to me, he, it, was, it's, it betrayed a, a failure to understand the role of the press uh, in this country. And it's not a war, it's just our job. And I think that was a message that I wanted to convey to our newsroom is that we're not at war with him. Uh, we're just doing our jobs. We sh and we, just because he's waging war on us doesn't mean we should wage war on him, nor does it mean that we should shy away from doing our, our work uh, or be intimidated by it. Um, and so I think it just requires a, a sort of a, a, a focus on, on what our mission is and just pursue it in a dispassionate um, way. And, um, and that's, what I've, that's really what I've tried to encourage. I mean, they can interpret it. I mean, the Trump administration would interpret it as a tax on them, but they're not a tax. They're just our job. Uh, and look, the Post is doing the same thing with the Biden administration, same thing with the Obama administration. You know, there's an assumption among some people that we had some sort of cozy relationship with the Obama, uh, you know, warm and cozy relationship with the Obama administration. We surely did not. Uh, they did not view us as, a, as an ally of theirs. Um, and we did very aggressive work on the Affordable Care Act and the mismanaged rollout of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and on a number of other subjects. And, um, you know, they, the Obama administration denied us interviews with him for years. I mean, the last two years we asked incessantly and were denied over and over and over again while they gave interviews to media outlets that they did view as being in their camp. And they certainly didn't view us as being in their camp. So we're in nobody's camp. Uh, you know, we're in the camp of being a journalist. That's it. What are some of the lessons we, we can learn from covering such an intense administration in, in our last president. Um, are there lessons that you've seen in, in, again, leading your newsroom, trying to cover these stories in a, a news cycle that was, that uh, I joke constantly that, you know, the old days we could count on, you know, uh, one, one big story for a news cycle, but the last five years, certainly it seemed like there were four or five news cycles on any given day. How has it changed? How did you adapt in the newsroom to, to adjust to this pace? Uh, how did you sort out what was the most important story of that day uh, while not only reporting the story, but then also providing that wonderful layer of investigative uh, uh, and accountability, uh, accountability journalism that needed? Are you talking about during the Trump administration or during the, over the past year? Or... Uh, during the Trump administration, for sure. Uh... You know, we have a staff, their job, they know their, their tasks better than anybody. They're at the ground level, they're at the grassroots. I was sitting in an office all day. 
so uh, you know they, know they know that their job is to kind of try to cover uh, what I was talking about before. Who's making these policies? What is their impact? Uh, how did they come about? Who exercised influence so that those policies were put in place? Um, and uh, and ultimately, is the administration telling the truth? Um, and I'm not just talking about fact checking. I'm talking about you know is it um, is it more broadly, is it telling the truth to the American, to the American public? So, you know, when we're talking about, for example, you know, health guidance during a pandemic, is the administration in fact providing correct scientific, the correct scientific assessment of what, how the public should, um, should react and what they should do and what measures they should take? Um, or is it in fact exercising political influence over an age, agency or agencies that um, that determine what the American policy should be. And so those are the kinds of things that we, I think we, we always need to do. And as I said before, that's true of both Republican and Democratic administrations. And, um, and so that's, that's basically how we approached it. And during the past year in a, covering uh, stories remotely uh, in, in virtual newsrooms. What, what was your approach to how you uh, addressed, again, news cycle had, didn't slow down, but you still had to lead a newsroom of, of hundreds of reporters, thousands around the country uh, in capturing the story. What approaches did you take? Uh, what lessons did you learn in, in keeping up with the news and telling good stories during this period? Yeah, well, the past year has been particularly challenging, obviously. Uh, none of us uh, could forecast a pandemic. Uh, maybe we should have, but we didn't. Um, and we've written about that, but I don't think anybody was prepared for anything of, of the sort uh, that we've experienced this past year. So, um, you know, we were confronting a lot of things that we had never experienced before. And that's true, of, frankly, of the entire, the entire year and all the stories that developed. So we had to learn how to work remotely, uh, which is the first time that we'd ever had to experience that. How do we communicate with each other? How do we collaborate? How do we um, uh, how do we take care of people who are having to work under you know, their emotions that people have? How are we gonna, how, how are people going to work when they have to homeschool their kids? How are younger people who you know at a very key moment for them to develop their social lives uh, that they're stuck in you know a bedroom because they share an apartment with several others? Um, all of that, I think, was really difficult. And I think that, you know, the issue was how do we provide people the facilities that they need uh, because they didn't have the, necessarily have the equipment that they needed at home, uh, but also how do we take care of uh, people emotionally? And that's really a challenge. And there's probably a lot that was left undone, but, you know, I think the post tried very hard to deal with that. Um, and then, of course, over the course of the year, there were other big stories. I mean, the the social, the racial justice protests, uh, of course, uh, that was big. You know, obviously, that affected a lot of people very emotionally, uh, particularly black journalists on our staff. And and um, you know, I think that uh, you know that was that was new because there had been other, obviously, other. There's been a lot of racial injustice in this country over the years, and we have covered that. But this, uh, the killing of George Floyd, obviously affected people in a way that um, it was there was bigger, that was greater. That that, uh, and I, it took some people, including myself, uh, time to sort of recognize what the full impact of that was on on members of our staff. Uh, it was just the reaction was different from what we had seen in other instances of racial injustice uh, and killings, as a matter of fact. Uh, so, uh, like the Dylan Roof killing didn't have the same, didn't at least appear to have the same impact on the staff that the killing of George, um, the Dylan Roof killing of people in a church did not have the same impact as uh, the killing of George Floyd did. Uh, so, so I think we had to react to that and, um, and that, you know, that required a lot of um, reflection and, uh, and, uh, and, and so I think that we, we came to understand that better, at least I did. And, um, and then I think, uh, you know, obviously the election was incredibly intense um, and the aftermath of the election was even more intense. Um, and, um, you know, we have to stay focused on what our job is uh, because we're, we were constantly under attack 
And we weren't just under attack, but people's security was at risk. Um, and there were many threats made against people on our staff. And, um, and uh, they have to be unaffected, in a way, be unaffected by that, just do their jobs. And um, so um, there was a lot to learn. And I don't think anybody, nobody, nobody could have anticipated a year like we've had uh, with the stories of this sort uh, all in one year. Uh, any one of them would have been huge, uh, but to have three gigantic stories like that in one year was immense. And then even after the election, you thought it would be over, but in fact, all it did was uh, become even more intense. And, um, and so, you know, I hope we don't have another year like that, uh, but I think we've all learned how to deal with uh, several different kinds of crises all in one, all in one year. Yeah, there's still this lingering cloud of dust about the public's trust of the media. Uh, how do we regain that? Um, do we ever regain that? Uh, what, what do you think? Well, I think we have to put it in context. I mean, I think that there's declining trust in all institutions in this country. And so um, I think that... Um, Look, uh, the trust in Congress is very low. Trust in the presidency has fallen. Trust in uh, uh, banks has fallen. Trust in uh, uh, religious institutions has declined. Uh, trust in, uh, most more recently, trust in the police, which had always been pretty high, has actually fallen. And now we see that trust in actual scientists uh, and the medical establishment has declined as, as well. And so I think we do have a crisis of trust in institutions generally in this country, and that should be a matter of serious concern. And so, you know, we as journalists have to do everything we can to make sure that we fortify uh, our institutions and, and, and instill trust. Um, I think that involves a number of different things. Uh, I think we need to talk more about who we are. Um, I think there's a lot of misimpressions about who journalists are in this country, that we seem to fit a stereotype, that we're all from the East Coast, we all went to supposedly elite colleges, that we all grew up in privileged circumstances or whatever. Um, not true, of course, about, uh, about our newsrooms. We have people from all over. Number two is I think we have to um, be more transparent about how we go about our work. We have to show more of the work. If we have original documents, we need to show them. If we have uh, videos that are the basis for our stories, we need to show them. Um, if we need to annotate our stories so that people can see what we're referring to, we should do that. Uh, any, anything that we can do, uh, we can talk more about the methodology we used in our, in our stories, show more of it. And, uh, and explain in instances where we're using anonymous sources, why that was necessary. So that's number two. I would say number three is that we need to make sure that we cover everybody in the country for an institution like the Washington Post, which has that mission, or if you're a, a regional or, or local newspaper that you cover your community, um, everyone in the community, that, and, and make sure you're doing that. And that... Um, that we become good listeners, um, uh, you know, that we, I think there's way too much talking uh, in, in the journalism profession at the moment, particularly on TV. Everybody's talking, everybody's yelling, everybody has an instant opinion, all that sort of stuff. Frankly, it does not appeal to me. Um, and uh, I think our job is primarily to be listeners and communicators. Uh, and so I think we need to understand people in all their complexity um, and, and try to reflect that. And our and our reporting uh, in a sort of sensitive way doesn't mean that everybody's going to be happy with our stories. They surely won't be, uh, but it means that we've done our job in terms of listening. And then finally, I think that we, you know, I, I do think that in our own personal behavior, we need to do things that are actually work to uh, strengthen our institutions and not to cause people to doubt uh, the integrity of our institutions and the mission of our institutions and. I think that does get into the into the area of social media, is that we um, we need to make sure that what we do in every form is uh, emblematic of the values that we have as an institution. Uh, we are institutions, by the way. We're not just a, a roof over the heads of a bunch of individuals. Uh, it's not just a workplace. It is an institution that has its own principles, standards, and practices.
and I believe those principles, standards, and practices need to be um, need to be uh, observed, uh, regardless of where we happen to be. We happen to be uh, whether we're publishing in our uh, print paper, whether we're publishing online, whether we happen to be on radio or television, or um, or whether we happen to be posting on social media, and. Um, because people see us as representatives of the institution, even if we think we may be acting in a personal capacity. And the reality is that we are representatives of these institutions <laughs> and that, excuse me, and um, we are representatives of these institutions. And, um, and the reason that people have followers on Twitter, for example, is because we work for these institutions. If we didn't work for these institutions, uh, they wouldn't have followers. And so we're more than just a platform for people to uh, express themselves or draw attention to themselves. Um, we are representatives of the institutions we work for. And I think when we, when we veer from that, we uh, put at risk the reputations of our institutions and we undermine trust in these institutions. Thank you, Martin. You uh, really hit a, a number of key issues that goes to another big question that we we certainly have here at the Mayborn School and around the country is, is the future of of newspapers, of media in general. Not everyone has the uh, opportunity of getting a Jeff Bezos to invest. What, what's your vision? Certainly the Post, the New York Times and others did experience a huge growth in digital subscriptions. But what's the future of so many newsrooms that are are shrinking in size, uh, but still have this great commitment to holding the uh, the uh, public officials to account and so many other key things? What's your vision there? What's your advice to those editors and and uh, those who want to get into this business of what the future looks like? Sure. Well, the first thing I would say is um, uh, be optimistic. Don't lose hope. Um, I think um, I, I'm not Pollyannish about the challenges that are faced, particularly by regional and local news organizations. Um, but I think it's also important to remember that uh, it, was, it wasn't that long ago that people were predicting the New York Times would go out of business. Uh, its stock had fallen from $50 a share to $3.50. And, uh, and it wasn't that long ago that people were predicting the Washington Post would go out of business too. Uh, so, um, you know, it wasn't that long ago, frankly, and I recall this when people said that local news organizations were better positioned than national news organizations to deal with the internet because um, uh, they were just they were just threat less threatened by the internet uh, and that the Google and and Facebook were really drawing advertising in large part from the national news organizations and less from the local ones. That turned out not to be true, but um, so. Um, I think we can't lose hope uh, and uh, we should stay optimistic. And frankly, if we're not optimistic, then we're not going to succeed uh, because you don't succeed by expecting that you're going to fail. Uh, you succeed by expecting that you're going to succeed. Um, that said, I do think that there are, um, there are some models out there. I think that we're seeing among certain uh, organizations with a print heritage that they're beginning to find some stability. Uh, I think through the pay models that they have, uh, that they are fairly strict pay models. I mean, and I think it's important to remember that when we were focused primarily on print uh, publications, we didn't um, we didn't give the paper away for free. Um, when somebody wanted to read the physical paper, they actually had to pay for it, and um, maybe they could read what was visible in the in the like in a box uh, a, a little bit, uh, but other than that, they couldn't read very much, and so. I think the same principle needs to hold, uh, commercial principle needs to hold and uh, on, on digital is that maybe people can see a little bit, but they can't see very much unless they decide to pay for it uh, because it costs money to do this. Now in exchange, I think we have to, there's a, there's a bargain that's being made there. And that is we ask the public to pay and we offer them something worth paying for. Uh, so it can't be that, you know, we have uh, essentially eviscerated the, the journalism that we offer and then say, now you need to pay for it we need to offer something worth paying for. And one of the things that I think people are willing to pay for, it's evident, uh, is that they're willing to pay for um, accountability journalism. Uh, they want the 
press to hold their government accountable. They want the press to hold public, uh, powerful institutions accountable. I mean, when I was in Boston, uh, one of the major reasons, and I think this is still the case, one of the major, major, major reasons that people supported the Boston Globe was because of the work of the Spotlight team. And so one of the things that I endeavored to do was to try to increase the volume of investigative reporting we were doing and to produce investigative reporting more, more quickly uh, on a faster turnaround basis. And I've done, I did that at the Boston Globe and I did that here at the Washington Post. And, uh, and that has been highly beneficial. Uh, people, you know, people forget the good things we do. They always remember the mistakes and the disasters. Uh, they'll never forget those. Uh, but you can do a great investigation and they remember it for a few weeks and then they forget that you did anything. Um, so it's important to continue to do good, high impact work, make sure that it's rigorously researched and make sure that it's, um, that it's uh, together really well and, and that it stands up. And so, um, uh, and I think that's something that people will pay for uh, because they see that as a unique role for the press and there's nobody else doing it, uh, at least not as frequently as they ought to. And so um, uh, I do think there should be strong pay models. I also think, by the way, that, um, uh, that there are some nonprofit models that are beginning to show some promise, and, uh, and that's encouraging. It's not a lot, frankly, but it's to, you know, to some degree, and, and, that, and that's good, so. Excellent. Uh, if for younger journalists, are there things that to newspapers and, and media need to do to attract more younger readers and viewers? Uh, no doubt there are. Uh, I'm not sure I have all the, all the answers there, but I actually think younger people are reading pretty regularly. I mean, the Washington Post, about 30% of its readers or a third of its readers online are, uh, are millennials uh, so or younger. So, I um, mean, that's not bad. And if you look at, uh, I think the New York Times has a little bit more than that. And and then there's some other online operations that are close to close to 50 percent, actually. So, um, you know, I think that we need to um, we need to take advantage of all the tools that we have. Uh, so and that and storytelling needs to change. It needs to be focused. I think it's becoming much more visual. Uh, we at The Washington Post have invested heavily uh, in our visual journalism. We've we added another 14 positions for uh, graphics and design. Uh, because we're finding that uh, it, it's very beneficial to explain complicated subjects uh, with, um, uh, with visuals um, and interactive graphics with animation, with annotations, all of that. And so I think that's one way we can do it, um, is recognize that uh, just journalism is becoming more visual and storytelling needs to, to change. Um, and, um, and, and also to recognize that, you know, a lot of young people are coming into, and old people or older people, they appreciate this too. They're coming into subjects um, almost like in the middle of a soap opera. And uh, they don't know who the players are. They don't know, uh, they, they don't know the background. Uh, we need to step back more often and explain things and answer people's questions for them uh, and serve as a resource for them. And I think that's been particularly helpful during uh, the pandemic. Uh, where we cannot, we cannot explain enough. Um, and, um, and so, and that was true through the election and um, people simply want basic questions answered. And that is not beneath us to uh, step back, uh, even if we've explained it before, to explain it again uh, and find a very accessible way of doing so. And people appreciate that. Thank you. As you look back on your, your career, are there stories that stand out in your mind as, as things that you, you'll remember the most? Uh, are there stories you wish you could have gone off after a little bit more uh, diligently? Well, all the stories that we got beat on are ones that I wish we had done better on. So, uh, um, you know, um, I, I don't know. There's not, I mean, there's certainly stories that I appreciate that we did. I mean, we've talked about a bunch of them, you know, certainly the Catholic Church, certainly the NSA, certainly our coverage of Donald Trump. When I was in Miami, the, the recount that we did, um, which actually showed that Bush most likely did win Florida. Um, and um, all of that was good. I mean, I do think, and in Florida, 
we covered the case of Elian Gonzalez uh, when I arrived. Uh, we did want a Pulitzer for our coverage of the raid to uh, recover him and deliver him to his father, who was then waiting in Washington, as, and then re they returned to Cuba. Uh, I do think we, you know, in instances like that, we needed to do a, we needed to do a better job of just listening to people in the community. I think that uh, a lot of people in the Cuban American community in Miami felt that they weren't fully understood. Um, and that they weren't fully explained uh, to, to the broader public, to the non-Hispanic uh, population. And, um, you know, and, um, and so I think we need to do a better job of that. If I, when I think back on that, and it's something that stuck with me over time is that it's sort of how do we, I mean, part of our job is helping segments of the American public understand other segments of the American public. Um, they may not agree with them, uh, they may have a different view, but at least they need to know where they're coming from. And, and I very much appreciate those kinds of stories that give me insight into how people think uh, and why they think the way they do and what their life, what life experiences they've had inform their, inform their thinking. I think it's important that we not be, um, that we not sort of say, well, you know, be dismissive of anybody um, that we recognize that uh, they've come to their their view of life based on their life experiences and we need to understand what it is whether we you know whether we personally are sympathetic or not i think it's important to communicate that to people otherwise we as a country well people just won't understand each other and i think we should help do that help help accomplish that what led you to your decision to retire now and what happens next? Well, I've, as I said in my farewell note, I've been in this business for 45 years. Uh, I've been top editor at uh, three newspapers or news organizations for 20 years. Um, that's a long time. Uh, at each of those news organizations, I went in as a person from the outside. Although I had worked at the Miami Herald, it had been 20 years since I uh, had, had left. Uh, so while there were still some pe people there I knew uh, uh, from my early days as a journalist, uh, I was essentially coming in outside, from outside the organization. In Boston, I was definitely coming in as an outsider. And at the Washington Post, even though I knew you know, a number of journalists at the Washington Post, I was coming in, I had never worked at the Post and I was coming in as an outsider too. And those are all, that's, that's tough work, I got to say, and and it was during a tough period, a period where journalism was under just a tremendous amount of strain, and um, and uh, and particularly in the during the time of the internet, the era of the internet, and particularly after, I would say the early two thousands when high speed broadband became available and when social media developed and when we now have you know we get our news off of uh, mobile phones. Um, and, uh, and, and we as news organizations are involved in audio and video and uh, interactive graphics and everything, that, things that are entirely new, just the demands of the job are, um, I mean, they're just every minute of every day, um, every, you know, and they don't stop. And, um, and uh, so it takes, it takes its toll. I mean, uh, where you feel like you don't have any free time, you don't have any flexibility, you're constantly on duty. And, um, and I'm at the stage at age 66, where uh, I would like to have more, uh, I would like to have more free time, and I would like to have more personal liberty to do what I want when I want to do it. And the nature of these jobs now is that you don't, um, at least of the way that I did the job. And, and so, um, and the way that I think the job should be done. And, uh, and so I felt like the time had come for me to enjoy more personal time and personal liberty. And um, that's basically, that was, the, that was the reasoning behind it. Excellent. What, uh, what does Marty Barron like to do when you're not in a newsroom? How do you spend your time? Uh, well, I do um, a lot of hiking. I do cycling. I do reading. Uh, I see friends. Um, that's basically what I do. I like to travel uh, when I hope we can get back to that. <laughs> and I like to see the world. And um, and so I want to do more of that uh, in my, my free time. Excellent. Well, thank you, Marty, for taking the time today to share some wonderful insights about uh, your career, uh, the future of journalism, some of the great work that you've done. 
uh, looking forward to your next chapter and hoping we can continue the conversation uh, in, the, in the days, weeks, and months ahead. <laughs> Thank you so right. much, Marty. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it.